Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to today's episode of Inpatient Myeloma Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. Patients can help accelerate the pace of research by joining clinical trials. If we doubled our participation from the very low, less than 5% that we currently have to 10%, researchers like Dr. McCarthy, who we'll be talking with today, could do their work at a much um, accelerated pace. Now, a a few items of business. If you'd like to receive a weekly email about past and upcoming interviews, you can subscribe to our Inpatient Minute newsletter on the homepage, and you can follow us there on Facebook or Twitter. We'd also like to tell you about a new site called MyelomaCrowd.org. That is the first comprehensive site for myeloma. It has, in a single place, everything you would want to know about myeloma. And it's a place where you can find out about the diagnostic testing that you might need, myeloma clinical trials, find a myeloma specialist, find and connect with other myeloma patients and support groups, or the Facebook groups. And we even cover what you might want to consider eating during, during treatment. Now, on to our show for today, we are very privileged to have Dr. Philip McCarthy of the Roswell Park Cancer Institute with us today. So welcome, Dr. McCarthy, and thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for the invitation to speak. Well, I'd like to give an introduction for you, if possible. Dr. McCarthy. Sure, thanks. Dr. McCarthy is the Director of the Blood and Marrow Transplant Program at Roswell Park Cancer Institute, and and he is a professor of oncology. Dr. McCarthy has been a BMT physician and hematologist and oncologist since finishing fellowship training in 1989. He's been the BMT Director at the RPCI since 1997. He's a member of the Cancer and Leukemia Group, the Cooperative, Cooperative Clinical Trials Group, the Center for Institutional Research on Blood and Marrow Transplantation, as well as a member of the editorial boards of the two BMT journals. He's been a clinical investigator in oncology, particularly in BMT, for more than 20 years. He served as a chair or co-chair of many clinical trials and is a member of the protocol team for the ongoing BMT Clinical Trials Network study. And we will get into those studies as we, as we go. Um, Dr. McCarthy is a member of ASH and ASCO, and his research interests are devoted to developing new auto and allo treatments for hematological disorders, including myeloma, that will lead to improved patient outcomes and decreased toxicity. So hopefully that's the most talking I will do during this, <laughs> during this show, Dr. McCarthy. Thank you so much. Yeah, and um, as one of the main presenters for the myeloma sessions at ASH, do you want to start by just telling us a little bit about what you were able to present there? Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk, well, first about the education session. There were three of us, Drs. Mateos, uh, Longren, and myself, and we each took a different portion, Dr. Longren focusing on smoldering, Dr. Mateos on the transplant ineligible uh, patient and uh, we and I talked on the transplant eligible myeloma patient and it, I guess the first thing you could talk about in terms of transplant eligibility is what do we mean by that and a lot of patients are quite fit even in above the so called older age group say sixty five and that transplant may be an option for somebody who is otherwise fit, and it's not really age criteria. In Europe, they have a tendency to go by age, so that often the cutoff is 65, and there are plenty of fit 67-year-olds, just as there are plenty of unfit 50-year-olds who may have other what we call comorbidities. They're they're ill uh, for other um, from other illnesses. And so, what we talked about was the current standard for. Patients who would be considered transplant eligible is they receive some form of induction therapy, and now we're moving more toward the triple drug uh, inductions where you would use uh, an IMID, an immunomodulatory drug, a proteasome inhibitor, and uh, steroids 
Uh, there's one other regimen that involves using an, a uh, proteasome inhibitor and cyclophosphamide in, in steroids, which is similar and generates similar results. And the, the goal initially is to treat the best response and then collect stem cells. There's currently a study that's ongoing. I can talk about that a little later uh, of transplant now versus transplant later. But assuming the patient goes on to stem cell transplant, um, the the patients brought, usually receive high dose malflin or some variation thereof, and then receives their stem cells back not so much as a transplant, but as a rescue. And then the patient recovers from that, and that can be a fairly intensive procedure. Um, and then we are faced with what to do next. And a lot of what we do is based on what the cytogenetics, what was the risk stratification as part of the um, upfront uh, evaluation of the patient. And then we will consider the patient for consolidation, which is more common in Europe. We are studying that in the U.S., as well as some form of maintenance therapy. And we've had all kinds of controversies with that, but it appears that maintenance will allow the patient to stay in remission or uh, have their disease in control for an extended period of time. And so there are a variety of different approaches to maintenance. One is using bortezomib. The Dutch reported on their results in, the, in uh, a couple of years ago and then also updated it at, um, at ASH. The French updated their study. The Italians have two maintenance studies uh, using lenalidomide versus placebo and the other one using lenalidomide and steroids. And there's some ongoing studies, one of which in the U.S. is the BMT-CTN, which is a single versus tandem transplant versus a single followed by consolidation, all followed by lenalidomide maintenance. And in Europe, there's two very large trials that are asking questions regarding both maintenance, consolidation, transplant now versus later, different types of induction. So there are lots of opportunities for patients to participate in trials and for both patients and physicians to better understand what's the best approach to treating myeloma. I hope I didn't talk too long. Oh, no, that's, that's great. And it's a lot to think about because there are lots of new options available. So it just gives you more choices. Yes. And that's good and bad because we still, for example, don't know what's the best induction regimen because the only comparative study was something called the evolution trial. <clears throat> Excuse me, Dr. Kumar was the lead author of that. And that was presented in blood, I think it's about a year and a half ago. And that was a phase two randomized trial. So it was really designed to see if you could get a hint of a signal as to which arm would be better. And what they showed in that was that a four drug regimen was actually inferior, uh, likely to be inferior to the either of three drug regimens, which is um, the LEN bortezomib dex uh, or the cyclophosphamide bortezomib dex. And uh, when they added, when they did four drugs where it was cyclophosphamide, LEN, bortezomib dex, they had too much toxicity. So we, we need to do these studies to make sure that we're doing the right thing f for our patients and we're not generating uh, regimens that are going to generate too much toxicity and the patient won't be able to get treated. The one theme that m most docs are thinking about is how can you get therapy into the patient with with them to able to tolerate it, have good quality of life, and not have gaps in the therapy where they got so sick from their last regimen that it takes them two months to recover from that or three or four months and and or you have to change to a different regimen because of intolerability. And that those types of things are of concern because it appears that the more you can expose the cancer to treatment, the better off the patient is going to be. And that gets into the whole, maybe we should talk about, go ahead and talk about when, what the experience you've seen is with when you should consider transplant. Good question. There is actually a clinical trial in the U.S. It's called the French American study, or <clears throat> so Dana Farber is leading it. Uh, Paul Richardson's the U.S. PI. Michelle Latal is the French PI, and our principal investigator. And what that involves is an RVD or a LEN bortezomib dex induction. Patients have um, their stem cells collected, all of them do, with a cyclophosphate mobilization. 
you could argue back and forth as to whether or not that that's the best way to go or if you should use something like Plerixifor or Mozabel. But anyways, that's how the study was designed. And then patients are randomized to either continued RVD uh, or onto a single auto transplant followed by RVD consolidation. All patients after completing this upfront therapy then go on to maintenance. Now, it gets complicated here because in France, they are giving maintenance for a year. In the U.S., the maintenance will be until progression. So this trial should hopefully tell us which patients should strongly consider a transplant up front, which patients could delay it, because this may, because they're doing a lot of cytogenetic testing and molecular analyses to try and risk stratify patients for whom transplant may be better. Because right now we can't say for sure. We do know in retrospective studies that the idea of you get treated definitely gets your stem cells collected. And then the idea of do you delay transplant or do you go to transplant right away, that question is, is not definitively answered. But both approaches are reasonable. Um, as long as the stem cells are collected early because if the patient gets a lot of therapy and, and essentially gets be- the marrow gets beaten up by the therapy, it's harder to collect stem cells and it's not as, it doesn't lead to as successful a transplant. Plus with myeloma, there's some centers that are doing tandem transplants. We can talk about that in a bit. And since the majority of patients do have disease recurrence, if the disease recurrence is prolonged enough beyond, say, two years, a patient could be considered for a second transplant after reinduction therapy to knock the cancer back down again and um, and control disease. So that was a rather long-winded response to saying you could. There are are people who can do it early or late. Um, I find that a younger patient who's rather fit, it's reasonable to consider an early transplant because they'll tolerate it fairly well. And then with close observation uh, and probably some form of maintenance to keep the disease from coming back. Well, I know on some of the other interviews where we're talking about trials that were possibly using a monoclonal antibody before, and, and they said if that doesn't work, then you could go to a transplant. So there's kind of a different, different approaches that you could take. What do you recommend to your patients when they come in and they say, let's say, for example, I were to be high risk. How do you how do you determine that? Yeah, them? good good question. Um, there are actually two really different high risk trials. Um, I think you you've interviewed both docs, but one is the RVD uh, plus elotuzumab versus RVD for very high risk uh, patients. That's uh, coming out of SWOG as part of induction, mm-hmm. and then there is the allogeneic uh, protocol, uh, which is about to open out of the BMT-CTN also for very high risk. I think if somebody is 70 years old and has high-risk features such as deletion 17 uh, chromosome abnormality, that would be a patient who perhaps the RVD-ELO versus RVD study would be a better choice because there's a lot of toxicity associated with allogeneic transplant. There's no right answer here. and And what we're doing is trying to figure out are these very high-risk patients going to benefit from either approach? And so there's small phase two studies that if there's a reasonable signal, it may be something we would consider then for trying to figure out how you do a comparative study later on. The other problem with this type of, of, of these types of treatments is a real disparateness between getting RVD ELO and getting an allogeneic transplant. And a lot of that is both driven by the center you go to, because some centers are going to be more inclined to offer one than another. Again, neither is is the better option. It's often we don't know, and that's why we're trying to find out. And sometimes it's personality driven by the patient in terms of how much risk the patient is willing to take. We, We have all different personality types, and some patients are incredibly aggressive in their approach. So, for example, a lot of patients will go to Arkansas, and they get a very aggressive approach to treatment. It's not allogeneic, but it's lots of transplants, at least two, and lots of consolidative therapy. And and that's one strategy for a highly dedicated, highly motivated patient. There are other transplant strategies or chemotherapy strategies that are a little bit less intensive. And so far, there doesn't seem to be much difference, but we need to do head-to-head comparisons. That's why, for example, the 0702 trial, which looked at a single versus tandem versus 
uh, single followed by RVD consolidation is a good study because it's going to give us some clues as to will patients be able to tolerate these things, the majority of them, and uh, as opposed to a self-selecting population, and and really will which which approach will generate the best results. So can, another long-winded answer. No, can you go into more detail about that trial? And what you're looking at and uh, the different approaches, a single versus tandem versus... Oh, sure. Yeah. This study just closed um, in the last quarter of 2013. And this was a, a BMT-CTN trial. It looked at um, patients who got some form of induction therapy. So the induction therapy wasn't mandated, that you had to do one thing or the other. And then patients registered after having a response. Uh, we do go back. We did collect all the data regarding um, uh, the cytogenetics and other features of the disease. And then the patients got a single autotransplant. And then they would either go to one of three pathways. Uh, they would get a second transplant and or they would get consolidation therapy for four cycles after the transplant or they would go straight to maintenance. All three arms are followed by maintenance. Now, um, this study, again, just closed, and it will take probably another year and a half to two years before it, the data will be mature enough to tell us which is the best approach. There are 250 patients on each arm, 750 patients total. The PIs of the study are Dr. Krishnan and Somlo and Stadmauer uh, with a uh, uh, and Dr. Pasquini. So they really did a great job of leading this trial. And um, and we're very grateful to all the patients who were willing to participate in this trial. The other thing we're doing on this is we are measuring what is called MRD, and that's minimal residual disease. So I'm going to be using that term a bit. And MRD can be measured in, in different ways. The, the two most sensitive ways are uh, by flow cytometry, and that's where you take antibodies which have a little fluorescent tag on them, and they bind to different uh, cell surface molecules, and you can have the antibodies that bind to different uh, markers on the tumor or on normal cells. And then you run it through a laser, and these, these little markers fluoresce and light up, and our flow cytometrists then measure what's normal and what's abnormal. Or the other one is to do molecular testing, uh, usually polymerase chain reaction. That involves looking for small bits of of uh, the immunoglobulin uh, gene that gets rearranged in the myeloma cell. It gets rearranged in normal cells, but it gets specifically rearranged in the cancer cell. The only problem with that is you have to have the usually the diagnostic sample to generate uh, markers that allow you to look for this um, look from MRD by this uh, molecular technique. Anyways, we are going to be looking at MRD along the way after completion of the upfront therapy and then at time points following uh, the start of maintenance. And the reason why we think this is important is the Spanish have shown uh, that if a patient becomes minimal residual disease negative, in other words, you cannot detect any cancer early on in their treatment, that is a good prognostic sign. And we want to see if we can reproduce that. The one thing we've discovered, and we've actually got some benefit out of this, is that their flow cytometers all do things a little bit differently. That's why it's not been easily standardized. Cytogenesis is a little bit easier, but flow is hard. So we actually had Bruno Paiva come visit us. He is the lead author uh, from Salamanca. He's actually moved to Pamplona now. But when he was at Salamanca, he did all, this flow, all these flow studies showing the importance of MRD testing. And so he came over and spoke with our flow cytometrist, uh, Paul Wallace. And, and now they are, have gotten together and they're actually setting up a conference to try and standardize all of this so it allows all physicians and their patients to understand what really is MRD negativity and is it the same in Salamanca, Spain, as in Buffalo, New York, as in Houston, Texas, so that we can get a better, we have a platform that we can really compare results. And that's a really important part of this is that we, we are trying to get together and standardize everything that we do so we can compare results. Well, Dr. Langer mentioned that too. He said even in the United States, there's a hundred times variance in the level of flow cytometry that's done. So, you know, you don't yeah. know as a patient even the questions to ask really. 
Yeah, and, and in fact, his uh, the woman he works with, the flow cytometrist at um, NCI, uh, she's been in touch with Paul, and they've been working on trying to come up with a standard procedure. And the Europeans, I love the name of this, they, their flow cytometry standardization procedure is called Euroflow. And um, it sounds like a prostate drug. But anyways, <laughs> it, is, it, is a, um, it is a way that you can take your data, your flow cytometry data, and plug it into their – they have an online algorithm, and it helps you determine if you, the type of disease your patient has and also whether or not they've, they're MRD positive or negative. It works, for, it works really well for things like chronic lymphocytic leukemia and some lymphomas. They're, they're tweaking it to try and get it to work better for myeloma. And most countries, not all, but most countries in Europe participate. So Dr. Langren's totally right. Until we can get a better handle on this and all people are, are, are using the same language with regards to how we analyze this, it's not going to be very helpful for, for manuscripts because it's comparing apples and oranges, and it's not helpful for the patients. So our hope is that within the next two years, this will be standardized so that there'll be a simple way of doing it. People will still want to do investigational work to see if they can find something better or a better way of doing it. But once it's standardized, it'll mean a lot more to us uh, in terms of understanding is there still disease left or is it gone, and can we keep it away. We have, we have the same type of thing with cytogenetics. Um, a lot of laboratories did not select for the myeloma cells when the bone marrow aspirate is done. And what that means is taking usually an antibody to a marker that's seen on the plasma cells called uh, CD138. CD stands for cluster designation. It was, the work sh it was how they set up all these different markers. And 138 is present on malignant plasma cells. And so you take an antibody and it binds to it and you conjugate or you have the antibody attached to a bead or some other column and it pulls out all the plasma cells. And then the laboratory people will do analysis of the chromosomes uh, in the, those plasma cells. And it's a much better way of getting good information for risk stratification is does the patient have a deletion 13 or a 414 translocation and all these other things that are associated with outcome and also the type of therapy a patient uh, should receive. The French were way ahead of us on this. They've been doing um, CD138 selection for years. Uh, Hervé Loiseau, Hervé Loiseau is the uh, PI or the principal investigator of the study genetic analyses. He's just done a great job of getting a standardization approach for that. And it allows the doctors and, and their patients to be able to figure out what's the best regimen uh, for uh, treatment. Now, the molecular testing that you're talking about, which test is that? Is that the genetic expression, uh, the gene expression profile test? Is uh, that a different test, or what test is that? It's a different. It's a different test. Um, I can talk about GAP in a sec, but the the this is PCR. So what what happens is, as plasma cells in all of us, like when we get a tetanus shot, our body starts making antibodies to tetanus, and they're not just one, but there's usually several, and so that's it's that's called a polyclonal response and then what happens is the the immunoglobulin chain the heavy and the light chains at at one end reconfigure their their it's called the binding site so that um it will specifically say for example recognize tetanus and there's a recombination event where these things get shuffled around in the in the developing plasma cell or de developing B cell to allow for different antibodies to be formed. Well, in a, in a myeloma cell, what's happened is they only the plasma cell is only making one type of antibody, usually, or a light chain or heavy chain. And so it is clonal. So you can take little bits of the DNA and make little primers, they're called, little groups of nucleotides that are based on the recombination where the genes were reshuffled and you can then do a DNA reaction to see if this is present or not in the bone marrow sample. It's, it sounds fairly complicated but it's I can remember doing this when I was a postdoctoral fellow and it was, it was a little tedious but it really mm -hmm. gave you answers if you were looking for small amounts of uh, the presence of any type of uh, cell population. 
the problem is you need to 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 measure that shuffling you need you most often need a diagnostic sample where there's a lot of plasma cells there or a sample where you have a sufficient number of plasma cells that you can isolate them out and make uh, these primers, they're called, to that particular clonal abnormality. Because if you have a contaminating population of all different types of cells, you, will get, you won't get a, a clean signal. So that's, that's the way you can uh, measure minimal residual disease by a molecular test called PCR. The Italians have done a lot of this, have some of the other uh, groups, Palumbo's group in particular. But it hasn't gone, it hasn't gone widespread because a lot of times you don't have a sample. If your patient is being treated in the community, they may not, they don't, this isn't a standard uh, test right now. It may be in the future, but so far not yet. Now, the GEP is something else. That's gene expression profile, and that's looking for RNA. So what happens is your plasma cell is full of DNA, and then to make protein, you, you make RNA, which is the intermediate molecule, and then from the RNA you make protein. It's translated into protein. So the GEP, which was developed at Arkansas, O'Shaughnessy's et al., with Dr. Barlogi, and what they show is that when they looked at their patients who got total therapy, and they've had a variety of different approaches over the years. I think they're up to total therapy five and six. And they um, looked at all the patients RNA expression, and this is hard to do because RNA is not a stable molecule, so you need a fresh sample. And then they looked at the different genes that were turned on and off in the patients who did well and those who did not do well. And they found, they have different panels, they found that seven, the 70 gene panel, uh, if the particular genes were expressed, they did not do as well as the patients who didn't have this profile. And it was about 15% of the patients, 16, 17%, somewhere in there. Now, there are others that have been developed. There's one that was developed in France. There's another one, I think the Mayo Clinic developed one uh, through ECOG, Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group. And the Dutch have one uh, called EMC92. The E stands for Erasmus Medical Center, which is the center, I believe, in uh, Amsterdam or Rotterdam. Anyways... They have a 92 gene uh, profile, which also think they think will allow them to predict good and, and bad outcomes. So the problem with all of these things so far with the GEPs is it identifies a high-risk population, but it doesn't tell us what we need to do. It tells them, it, us that these are patients who should be strongly cl- uh, considered for clinical trials, such as the RVD ELO versus RVD, uh, the SWOG trial, or the uh, BMTCTN ALO trial. Those would be both acceptable criteria um, for considering a patient for either of those trials because those are both high-risk features. So you can see molecular testing is used for a variety of things. One, it's used for risk stratification, um, both on a cytogenic and a molecular level. It's used for detecting minimal residual disease. So it allows us now, with these really interesting tools, to be able to help help us decide what's the best way to treat a patient. But the big thing to, to emphasize is everything needs to be standardized. The GP70 is standardized. There's actually a commercial company that makes it, uh, I think it's Signal Genetics. The EMC92 is at the FDA. Uh, they're trying to get approval for it. And so um, that is, they need to validate it more in, the lar- in larger data sets. They've done it in Europe. It needs to be done here in the U.S. There's one more thing as well with then is for risk stratification is um, proteins. And there's two ways of doing that. One is serum-free light chains, um, which looks at the amount of normal and abnormal light chains that are being made by the bad plasma cells. And what you want to see is normalization of that after therapy, because usually the serum-free light chains are abnormal because the plasma cell is either making too much of one or the other. There's two types of light chains. There's kappa and lambda. Kappa, it's like K and L. And, the, and either the cancer cells are making too much kappa or too much lambda, and so there's an excess of one or the other, and we can follow that uh, for determining response. There's a new test that was just FDA approved um, 
the company's name is The Binding Site. Uh, they make the serum-free light chains, but they now have made something called Heavy Light, which is going to be able to tell you how much of the monoclonal protein that's being made by the cancer cell, how much of it is polyclonal, which is all the good all the different ones that you expect in a normal situation, and how much are monoclonal. And right now it's only available for IgA and IgG myelomas. But there's some data to show that this may allow for risk stratification in in a way, in a different way. Instead of cytogenetics, it does it on the basis of how much abnormal protein is there. And when you combine it with more uh, traditional ways of risk stratification, like the international staging system, which involves measuring the amount of albumin in the blood as well as the beta-2 microglobulin, you can now incorporate this heavy light. And it's a quick and easy way of uh, determining risk. And that's another thing. You, you want to have these tests, but you also want to make sure that they're practical to do. And these are very practical to test, tests that you can do right away. Okay, so when you have a patient come into your clinic and you want to be gathering data for research and, and once you start treatment, some of those markers are lost, what tests do you standardly have your patients perform? After th- Oh, to, to monitor response? Well, just for diagnostics and, and to oh. determine treatment. Got it. If they're newly diagnosed patients, then... Everybody gets blood, urine testing. We usually will do a 24-hour urine to measure the amount of protein in the uh, urine. Uh, uh, Is there albumin in there because the kidneys are leaky? Are there monoclonal proteins? In the blood, we're looking for monoclonal proteins, both whole immunoglobulin as well as the serum-free light chains. We'll measure chemistry panel, kidney function, uh, albumin level, beta-2 microglobulin, uh, these are uh, uh, these are basic things that we'll be looking for on a on a routine chemistry screening. We'll also measure the patient anemic. We'll get a CBC, and then um, usually there's something that tells us this patient has too high a protein. We're we're pretty strongly suspicious that the patient has a uh, either has a myeloma or may have monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. And so then they will get a bone marrow test, and our bone marrow test is sent for routine histopathology, which means we'll take a look at it under the microscope. Uh, Usually the pathologist does that, or we may go over to the lab to look at it as well. And um, that's done via taking some liquid out, um, the bone marrow aspirate, as well as taking a small piece of bone, um, uh, which gives us an idea of what the architecture of the bone looks like. The aspirate is going to give us uh, a better look at the cells, the, the biopsy gives us the architecture and also a better percentage of the marrow in terms of how much of it is involved by uh, bad plasma cells. We'll also send it off for, um, as I mentioned, cytogenetic analysis earlier. Uh, we will send it for flow cytometry, which helps us determine the, the markers on the, uh, on the cancer cells. And we will also then do some type of radiographic workup. Um, Traditionally, we had done skeletal surveys. We still do them. Uh, But if a patient presents with any degree of pain, they're usually getting a spine MRI because we want to make sure that uh, there's nothing immediately pressing that needs to be dealt with, such as a compression fracture or potentially the the plasma plasma cytoma and aggregation of plasma cells is pushing on the spinal cord. And that means that we have to do something right away uh, off, it could be radiation therapy, it could be, ra- or usually it's steroid treatment with or without radiation therapy. And then sometimes we'll be doing PET scans if we are concerned that we're not finding a lot of radiographic evidence of disease, and sometimes that can be picked up with PET scan. So those are the sort of basic things that we do, and they're important to do to make sure that we have fully staged the patient. Um, we are doing now molecular testing, or we've been saving up to do it, it's a long, painful story, but in New York State, we cannot do a GEP-70 because the company is in the middle of negotiating with the regulatory people in, in Albany to get that done. So we did a few of them, but then we had to stop. So I've been anxious to get that restarted again. But we find that with cytogenetics, we have a pretty good idea on risk, uh, again, if they're done properly with the CD-138 selection. And also something called FISH, which is fluorescence in situ hybridization, which is a specific way of 
marking the chromosomes in the plasma cell to look for both deletions and translocations where the chromosomes get shuffled. And we were told that the fish, you they have certain probes and you get what you test for, but it may not show everything. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to know what you're looking for. That's correct. So okay. we know that there are certain chromosomes that are commonly associated with myeloma 13, 14, 17, 16, 21, also 5, 9, sometimes 11, If you're, especially if you're looking for hyperdiploidy. And so, yeah, these are big pieces of chromosome, and they're lit up with a – they have a fluorescent tag on them, and then they bind to different areas of the chromosome, and then they will light up. And if there's a translocation, you'll have movement of the color where you have two colors together where they don't belong next to each other if, if everything were normal. But you're right. We need to know what we're looking for. And right and, – and I also forgot chromosome 1. And right now – these are the most common, but there are probably more that we don't understand enough about because not all deletion 17s do have very aggressive disease. There are some that don't behave aggressively. There are some patients we were, we had been taught, I was taught as a medical student that IgD myeloma presents in renal failure and they do the they do don't do as well because the disease is very aggressive. I just had a patient who's 15 years out from his original presentation of IgD myeloma and has just had progression of his disease, he wasn't on ma any maintenance therapy because he was treated back in 1999. So oh. why there's something different about him. Right. And we don't, we don't know yet. And so that's why we're trying to collect all this. We have a large procurement bank here where we store samples, as do many other centers. And we're going to go, try and go back and look at why did this patient do well? What, is, what features of his disease caused it to behave in this way? And, um, and then there are others who have very aggressive disease that comes back. We, ha we have done some research. Um, we presented a small paper at ASH, um, a poster looking at immune reconstitution. Uh, at the time of transplant and also after um, at day 100 after stem cell transplant. And we found that patients who did better uh, had different types of T cells. They had an increase of a type of T cell called gamma delta and a type, another type called CD8 effector cells. And so we're trying to figure out how we can correlate this with what type of therapy they received. We're not sure if we're going to be able to do that because uh, we only had 70 patients. We're going to start. We're going to look at more. But are there ways that we can get patients' immune systems to be in a way, to be in a state that allows the disease not to come back? The Mayo Group has shown, in, and they've shown this in a variety of dis disorders, that lymphocyte count seems to uh, to correlate well with outcome. That if by day 15 after stem cell transplant, if you're lymphocytes are a certain level high enough, you do better than if they stay low for an extended period of time. So why that is, we're not sure. So we need to, we need to understand this better because, you, because it appears that the, the immunotherapy we're thinking about using may be dependent on having a good immune system to allow these drugs such as elotuzumab and daratumumab to work better. We do know that, based on preclinical as well as re clinical trials, that antibodies seem to work better when they are combined with lenalidomide. Uh, and we're not sure of the mechanism of how it works. Lenalidomide upregulates natural killer cells. It upregulates uh, what is called the immune synapse. So when the antigen-presenting cell is presenting to the T cell, lenalidomide will upregulate that interaction and cause the T cells to get activated. Now, if we can get them activated and, and then in concert with antibodies, we could potentially uh, kill off myeloma cells uh, because these antibodies are specifically designed to attack um, the myeloma cells and spare good cells. So these are all new things that are potentially on the horizon. Uh, and if we can understand our immune systems better and figure out ways to make the immune system work better, it may allow us to help keep the disease in check or, you know, the holy grail would be to cure patients. Yeah, that would be the best outcome ever. So now oh, let's, you jump got back, it. let's jump back a little bit and talk about once those, once your um, molecular profile has been determined or you know the genetics mm -hmm. of your subtype of myeloma, 
for your patients, how are you determining then the next step of treatment or what to recommend for them based on those markers, those biomarkers? Sure. Sure. We do know that patients with deletion 13 and 414 should likely get a proteasome inhibitor. And right now, the upfront treatment would be a bortezomib-containing regimen. Um, and so that helps right there. Um, and these are for transplant eligible. And I, we can talk a bit about the RD data, the first trial that was presented at ASH, but I'll say that for a sec. Um, and that, And then either combined with cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone or... Uh, combined with lenalidomide and DEX, you get, you treat the patient to best response. So right away, that's why um, we've been thinking about using uh, a proteus inhibitor as part of the upfront treatment. We do know with lenalidomide, it's a much better drug than thalidomide, for example. And you get, generate deeper responses without all the toxicity. The thalidomide has a lot more toxicity in terms of neurotoxicity. So you, you're thinking about that as well because the schedule is also important. Right now, the schedule for bortezomib is uh, two doses the first two weeks or for a total of four weeks every cycle. But if you have somebody who has significant diabetic neuropathy, you may want to be more – you're going to have to be a little more cautious because you don't want to have the patient have, disab patient have disabling neuropathy uh, from your treatment. So we're, we're in the middle of trying to then, – so then you may go to once a week, uh, and, which allows you to get more, more drug in and more tumor cell killing. So those are usually the types of induction regimens I'm recommending – in the old days, we used to use more doublets for um, uh, transplant-eligible patients, either RD, Lendex, or um, Bortezomib-Dex. But I think a lot of us are moving away towards using the triple therapy because it generates deeper responses. And deeper responses correlate much better with um, better outcome. She can collect stem cells earlier because you've had a better response. She can put them in the freezer. You can then continue the treat con continue the treatment uh, once you put the stem cells in the freezer and then take the patient on to transplant. So, so I think that what we're looking at now there's some studies. There's an ECOG trial that's going to be looking at in standard risk myeloma patients. They're going to do a carfilzomib Lendex versus bortezomib. Lendex as part of upfront induction therapy. And then um, patients either stay on that treatment, they can go on to auto transplant. And then there's a maintenance of two years, I believe, versus a maintenance until progression question that's also being asked as well in that study. So that's another interesting study for a standard risk patient population, those who don't have, say, deletion 17 and have more favorable cytogenetic features. And we think that carfilzomib may be a better drug in terms of neuropathy. There have been some cardiac um, issues that we don't understand completely just yet, but that may be incorporated into upfront therapy in the near future. There's also the other drug, Exazomib, or MLN9708, which is an oral proteasome inhibitor, which is in clinical trial. It'll probably be first released for relapse refractory disease, but our hope is that after it's approved that we'll start doing some trials with it as part of an upfront regimen, and we may then have an all-oral induction regimen of uh, exazomib, uh, lenalidomide, and DAX. That'd be pretty amazing. Oh, yeah. To have that. <laughs> yes. And then there's also pomalinamide, which was uh, just approved last year. And that is another imid uh, similar to thalidomide and lenalidomide, but a little more potent. And that is used right now for, again, relapsed refractory, and it appears to rescue patients who are, who are refractory both to bortezomib and or uh, lenalidomide. And so that's, that's another drug. It's been looked at up front um, in, by some groups, but there's not been a lot of trials yet, and I have a feeling that may take a little bit longer, but we'll see. The thing that's amazing about the IMIDs is that they're very small molecules, and just by tweaking the, them chemically, you get very different effects. So thalidomide has a tendency to be more neuropathic. It also interferes with angiogenesis, or blood vessel formation, whereas lenalidomide and pomalidomide don't. 
And there are other images in the pipeline, <clears throat> excuse me, that potentially will be released in the future, which we hope will have different effects and be, can be used differently. The one great thing is that there are so many new drugs that are being developed that, and looking at different pathways that it's going to allow us to be able to attack uh, the cancer at different points in different pathways in development and division of the cell or interactions with its microenvironment, it's called, uh, attacking it with antibodies that will um, grab it. One of my colleagues, uh, Sarah Holstein, has been doing some work on, um, it's called the geronial geronial transferase, GGTase. And what that does, it's involved with protein synthesis. And by blocking this pathway, you can actually cause the protein to back up in the myeloma cell. And so the myeloma cell gets stuffed with protein and blows up, which is a nice thing to have happen. And wow. so she's doing, some <laughs> she's doing some preclinical work on this, which we're very excited about. And that we hope it will lead to drug development. Again, a totally different pathway. Uh, as you know, there's a variety. There's AKT inhibitors, kinase and spindle uh, protein inhibitors. There's a variety of different things. That, that hit different pathways. Um, we may be borrowing from our CLL uh, doctors who use this abrutinib, which is a Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitor. There's some probably some there's preclinical evidence that this also may be another molecule that may be useful. Uh, it's, it's, it was just FDA approved for CLL, and my guess is that we're going to find some page, myeloma patients, probably in combination with other drugs, where the BTK inhibitor. Uh, Ibrutinib may have some efficacy in myeloma treatment. Well, I think a whole new world of different approaches has been opened up. So can we go back a little bit? Now, you mentioned an yeah. approach that, that you might be taking for deletion 13 or 414 patients. Is there any specific approach you take for deletion 17 patients or gene uh, or the, I guess I'm saying it wrong, but I think it's chromosome deletions or additions. But um for the deletion 17 or the addition of the one? Yes. Um, one is a little bit harder now. We're not certain. Um, if you go back and look at the Hovon 65 GMMG study, the Peter Sonnefeld's the principal investigator on that. And that was a, it's a little bit older study, so you have to take it with a bit of a grain of salt. Those patients who are transplant eligible either got that, which has been Christine Adramycin dexamethasone, and I am old enough to have remembered when that first came out, and we don't use VAD anymore. So that's one caveat on this. And they compared them to bortezomib, adriamycin, and dexamethasone. And they called that PAD. I think they didn't want to call it BAD. So they called it PAD because it stands for PS341, which is the preclinical name for bortezomib. So they got that as induction. They had their stem cells collected. And then they got a transplant. If they're in Germany, they got two transplants. In the Netherlands, they got a single. And then they got either maintenance to, with the VAD arm, got maintenance with thalidomide, low dose, or bortezomib, where they would get two doses a month. Uh, and both arms got those maintenance treatments for two years. And the patients who benefited the most from the um, bortezomib arm were those who had deletion 17. Whereas the patients who got the VAD followed by thalidomide maintenance did not see that benefit, and the deletion 17s did not do very well. What was interesting, though, was that the deletion 13s and 414s, there was a trend, but the thalidomide seemed to be give some benefit. So you didn't see a statistically significant difference between uh, those with deletion 13s or 414s, but you did with deletion 17s. So... I'm recommending bortezomib-containing approaches for both induction, and that's the other problem with the study. The bortezomib was part of the induction and the maintenance, but it at least told us that that patient population should get uh, the proteasome inhibitor. The other thing they showed in that study was that patients who presented in renal failure did really well with a bortezomib-containing induction. So that's also a very important lesson is that pa the standard right now is Patients with uh, renal failure should get a bortezomib containing regimen with dexamethasone. There's some studies looking to see if you can add a lenalidomide in low dose because it's partially renally excreted to see if that will generate a better re response. Now, the ones we're not certain. The Emory group had a nice um, 
paper, I think it's in press, but I know they presented it at ASH, where they use low-dose RVD, Lynn bortezomib dex, as maintenance therapy forever uh, until progression. And it was fairly well tolerated. They had reasonable results. It was a phase two. It was a small number of patients. But I think right now that that would be another approach. So if you didn't go on the, say, the RVD ELO versus RVD trial, I, I would first recommend, of course, a clinical trial. And I think the RVD ELO would be, that's right now the, um, the best trial uh, in an intergroup setting. You know, all the different cooperative groups are, ha- are having it open up. And that would be the best for a, a high-risk uh, patient population. Or if you had a very young patient, uh, somebody who was in their 20s or 30s, you, and had high-risk features, you could consider an allo transplant uh, for that patient population because we know right now with current strategies, uh, especially stopping treatment, that the, the lesion 17s and the 1Ps one, one uh, don't do as well. Um, but we don't know for sure. Sorry. Is there a specific transplant approach that you recommend for high-risk patients, whether you consider the single or the allo or the auto or... No, yeah, that's the the big question. We uh, I'll, let's do allo auto first. We have some young patients, and we don't have very many of them, but occasionally we'll get a 27, a 28 year old who has multiple myeloma, and they often have bad wrist disease. I can remember one young man had plasma cell leukemia, another serious presentation, another high risk feature, along with. Um, High LDH, that's another high-risk fixture, as, long as, as well as the GEP70. And those are the patients who I would consider for an allo transplant. Now, in the old days, by that, I mean five to ten years ago, the standard sort of was a high-dose Melflin auto-transplant followed by a reduced-intensity allo. And that was based on the fact that the SWOG uh, intergroup trial looking at um, chemo versus transplant versus allo, uh, auto transplant versus allo transplant. They found that um, uh, the allo transplant arm, which was myeloablative or full intensity, they did they had a very high toxicity. So that fell out of favor. Now we're looking at can we increase the uh, intensity of the uh, regimen so you don't have to do two in a row. You can do a single allo with a melphalan containing regimen. Some people are saying you should add bortezomib in, but that's not been compared in a head-to-head manner. I think the most important thing is to get as intense as possible without having the patient suffer extreme toxicity or die of complications of the transplant because we're not doing the patient any good in that situation. So we're trying to figure out how can we be the most intensive without having untoward problems. So right now, the jury's still out on auto reduced intensity allo versus a more intense um, single allo for very high-risk patients. For the, the standard still for tandem transplant is you'll do, if you don't have a very good response after the first auto, you can consider the patient for a second transplant to generate a deeper response. And thus, and I mentioned earlier that 0702 trial is hopefully going to give us some better information as to do we always have to do that second transplant if there's still a fair amount of disease, say less than a 90% reduction in the disease, less than a VGPR. Or can we consolidate the patient, say, with VRD and still get good results? Or if we put them on maintenance, will uh, will that be enough to clean up the, the uh, disease and knock it down so it takes a long time for it to come back or not at all? And those are questions that we just don't know until we see more mature data. Mm-hmm. Now, I know a lot of your work has been to do that, to alleviate toxicity and to improve outcomes. So maybe you want to talk about that and your open trials, and then we We'd better open sure. it up for caller questions. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah, boy, the time went fast. Um, I know, it does. What, but that's okay. We can, <laughs> we can go over. It's not a problem for me. <laughs> okay. No, it's not, no, I'm good, too. Um, what we've got in terms of alleviating toxicity, we're, we're working with one of our local biotech companies on trying to develop a strategy to um, uh, decrease the amount of mucositis that is generated by malflin. I found that 
that the three things that, well, there's several things, but one, mucositis. Some patients have very little, but some patients have a lot, and we, we aren't always able to predict what that is. So we're actually, some people have been looking for genetic uh, markers in the metabolism pathways to see if they can um, predict who's going to be high risk for developing mucositis and who won't be. So that's one. The other is uh, another common problem with melphalan is fatigue. A lot of patients really feel wiped out, even after their counts come back up, and that can persist for a few weeks. Are there some things that we can do to alleviate that sense of fatigue and allow people to feel better faster? Um, and then also, can we get the counts to come back faster? Right now, even with um, use of peripheral blood stem cells and uh, growth factor shots such as uh, GCSF or GMCSF, Patients still are neutropenic for for up to several days, and it's during that time period that the patient can get an infection. So the shorter the time period where the blood counts are low, the less the ch patient will be at risk for problems. The other thing melphalan does is it really um, beats up the GI tract, not just the mouth, but also causes a fair amount of diarrhea and uh, irritation to the GI tract. So if we can also come up with some molecules that will allow us to mitigate or, or um, decrease the severity of the, um, what we would call colitis or inflammation of the colon, that would also make it a lot easier. We wouldn't have to use as much intravenous feeding, something called to total parental nutrition. If we can get around that, it makes it a lot easier for the patient to get through this. Because the biggest issue still is toxicity. It, it's usually um, gone within the first 30 days in terms of severe toxicity, but the fatigue will last. And a lot of patients, it takes them a good couple of months before they're feeling fairly well. Uh, they're able to go back and do their regular job after their, their stem cell transplant. So we're working on that. Um, we're hopeful that, that we may have a trial within the next six months. I can't say a lot about it yet because we're trying to decide what's the best approach and which molecule to use. Some of the other trials we have open, we have the French-American trial, which is the transplant now versus delay transplant. And so that, we think, is an important study. That is that is open, um, what is actually now called the Alliance. It used to be called CLGB, but we merged a bunch of uh, cooperative groups, so we're called the Alliance for Clinical Trials in Oncology, or just the Alliance. We have an Alliance trial, which we are about to open, which involves using pomalinamide, exazomib, the MLN9708, the oral proteasome inhibitor, with dexamethasone versus POMDEX. And so that's, uh, we're, we're very excited about that trial because both, uh, both arms are re very reasonable treatment for relapse refractory disease, and we think that this may allow us to, uh, to better understand it. will the addition of exazomib generate better responses. Peter Voorhees uh, from University of North Carolina is the PI of that study, again, through the Alliance, which is open in Alliance centers. We are also going to be participating with the Array Biopharma trial. That's the um, uh, KSP uh, inhibitor, kinase and spindle protein, and that inhibits the microtubules, which are... Um, which allow the cell to uh, divide, um, pull the chromosomes apart and make a second cell or make two cells. And um, if you can interfere with this, you could uh, potentially um, uh, prevent the myeloma cell from dividing. Um, a lot of what we're interested in is, is it in it, is its activity as a single agent, then, of course, it will likely be combined with other agents in the future. That's a pharma-sponsored uh, trial. We have finally a last one. Now, this is very interesting. This is sort of an immunotherapy uh, trial. It's a phase one. We're opening it up. In it's for hematologic malignancies, uh, people who have relapsed after uh, a transplant, uh, both an allo and an auto, but it's designed for refractory myeloma in particular. It's a fusion protein of IL-15, and um, it appears that this uh, molecule will induce CD8 T memory cells, increase um, something called interferon gamma, which is an inflammatory cytokine, which then may allow the immune system to get regulate, upregulated and have an anti-myeloma effect. Because it's a phase one, we're looking now for toxicity, and our hope is that, that once we have the dose, we'll be able to combine it with some active agents and maybe even overcome resistance because we've upregulated the immune system. So Dr. Holstein is the PI of the 
of those trials in the relapse refractory. And my colleague, Dr. Chuchman, is the PI of the upfront uh, versus delayed transplant studies. So those are our major research focus now. And of course, we're still looking in our patients who get standard auto transplant uh, at m- immune reconstitution and we're we're hopefully going to have a strategy within the next e- within the year as to how we might modulate that oh and lastly my colleague dr kelvin lee is doing an interesting tr- uh, study it turns out that if you give a patient lenalidomide and then vaccinate them with say the pneumococcal vaccine they make better responses and that's pretty exciting. So it's a potential platform for dendritic cell or tumor cell vaccines with lenalidomide to upregulate the, the body's own immune response to that. Now, what he's doing is he's looking to see how much bortezomib wipes that all out. In fact, there's some people who are talking about using bortezomib for, you know, how children have severe peanut allergies. Mm-hmm. If you give bortezomib, you will completely wipe out their B cell production and you will wipe out their antibody production. So what he's going to try and do is reset the clock with this by giving the bortezomib, giving immunoglobulin, uh, giving vaccines, seeing how well or not, likely how not uh, they will respond. And then are there certain vaccines that still, despite the bortezomib, you get uh, antibody uh, response so that would allow them to continue to use the bortezomib during treatment. So that's another small trial that we're doing here to help us under better understand the immune system. And that, that sounds like an of early trial, or is it pretty far along? That's, a, that's an early trial. They've, he just opened that up. So it's just gonna, he's going to do about 10 patients and then measure antibody responses while they're receiving uh, bortezomib and then antibody responses to vaccines. Wow. Well, there's uh, so much going on. It's really exciting. Now, I'd like to open it up for caller questions. So if you have a question for um, Dr. McCarthy, please call 347-637-2631 and press 1 on your keypad. So we will start with caller at phone number 934-2611. Okay, go ahead. Hi. Um, hello, doctor. Uh, my name is Rashmi, and I have a Actually, a couple of questions, if you don't mind, one's general, one's personal. So my first question is, does it matter where you get the transplant for better survival and remission rates, or does all transplant facilities provide standard care and treatment? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I think all transplanters uh, like to say they have the best center. Um, yeah, but you, it's hard to compare. Now, let's break them out, auto and allo. For aloe, it's easier to compare, um, but a lot of patients with myeloma don't go to aloe up front. But there is a um, place that you can look up the results of the aloe treatment, the aloe transplants. It's called BeTheMatch.org, the National Marrow Donor Program and the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Research, CIBMTR, are the ones who manage this, this website. And you can go and look at any transplant center reports da- allogeneic data throughout the United States. I think it's like 147, 148 centers, and look up how okay. well they do um, for allo transplant. That's one. For auto, it's a little bit different. Some places post their their results, um, and some places uh, they'll give. You may want to look at. It's it's much harder because there's no public clearinghouse for that. However, it, the the you want to find out number one: do they have a dedicated unit? Um, do they have dedicated personnel to doing this? What kind of high dose regimen are they giving? Uh, do they participate in clinical trials? Are they a member of a cooperative group? Are they associated with an academic center? And you get a better feel for how they do. And then I'd also want to say, look talk to some patients who've gone through this and see how well they do. To be quite frank, a myeloma patient should not, the the death rate, the toxicity death rate should be the same as an induction chemotherapy rate. So it should be about 1% to 2% max. And to me, it's a catastrophe when we lose a patient due to toxicity. So that's the mm-hmm. most important thing is is that you find out you have to ask a lot of questions and find out volume and things like that. It's a lot harder, though, for an auto transplant than it is for allo. Allo, the data is a little bit more readily available. 
Oh, okay. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. And my other question, you did touch base on some part of it where you said there isn't a good answer, but my husband is detected. They say that he barely uh, crossed the line to myeloma. Um, so at that point, is it beneficial to get an early transplant and aggressive you know, treatment, or is the therapy and other things be better? Yeah. Yeah, so in other words, was he did he have smoldering myeloma? Yeah, only for a couple of months he got detected. They said was smoldering in November, but mm-hmm. January they did like a PET scan and PET scan was inconclusive and then in uh, they did a dye uh, MRI and they could see mm-hmm. like some lesions, you know, like maybe a couple barely, which uh, they see it barely is what they say. Mm-hmm. But uh, so they wanted to do steroids and uh, some uh, radiation, and then you know, I don't know, they're they're considering stem cell transplant, but um, that's what I wanted to get your opinion on. Like in Got that it. early stage, would that be good or what? Well, this is you've you've raised a lot of important questions. So, nothing substitutes for seeing a patient and reviewing all the records. So, I don't want to specifically say your husband must do or not do something without right. looking at everything. I mm-hmm. But the classic way of deciding um, whether or not a patient needs therapy is: do they fulfill CRAB criteria? And CRAB stands for high calcium C. R is renal or renal failure. Mm-hmm. The patient have renal insufficiency. A is anemia, and B is bone disease. Now, mm-hmm. sometimes, sometimes people will have a single lesion or a plasma cytoma, and that is it. They may have a small amount of monoclonal protein in their bloodstream. That's not enough that you would consider high enough to treat. And if it's just one plasma cytoma, sometimes just treating that with radiation and stopping is adequate Mm -hmm. and that you don't have to do anything more. So I think it's very important to see, is this on the MRI, is this a big lesion, is it causing problems and all these kinds of things. And then the percentage of plasma cells is also very helpful for understanding the bulk of disease. If 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 you're 5 or 10%, that's very different than 20 30, 40, yeah, 50% he, plasma cells. He only had 10 to 12% plasma cells in his last bone marrow biopsy. And mm-hmm. uh, right now, uh, you know, the, le- the lesion is like they said is really small, but he has multiple fractures in his spine. Ah, so he does. Uh, okay, that then that would lead me much more towards thinking that he may need therapy, especially think... Has he had a DEXA scan, no, uh, the bone density no. scan? It might be oh, worth getting density. a bone density scan. Yeah. The bone density scan was normal. His first MRI with the, without a contrast was okay. They couldn't see anything. The PET scan yeah. was inconclusive. And the one with the dye shows like real little bit shadows or whatever. So. Mm. Yeah, so if you have multiple fractures, that would me, lead me more to think that there's more tumor burden there. Uh, and so I'd want to, you know, and that's something you would discuss with his doctors. Um, are you absolutely certain that these fractures are related to the myeloma? It sounds like it would be if he's a relatively young man. And that would mm-hmm. lead me more towards the use of a bisphosphonate to help strong, strengthen the bones, uh, prevent more skeletal-related events, they're called, or SREs, as well as embarking on some form of therapy. And so that there, it sounds like the B criteria and the CRAB criteria is being uh, fulfilled, and thus the doctors are, are considering treatment. Oh, so the treatment like the stem cell transplant, you mean? Well, you the- you would you would first start with induction therapy, and then and then after getting that induction therapy to generate a response, knock down the protein in the bloodstream, etc., then collect stem cells, and then the decision is: do you do the transplant now or later? And I think that's something, depending on his age, how well he's doing, and a variety of other factors, um, mm-hmm. would be a reasonable consideration. Yeah, he he does feel fine though, and his he's about fifty eight years old. Yeah, so he's fairly young. 
So I think a lot will be to, to you know the number of fractures there are discussing that with the doctor, making sure that you know are you certain that these are related to his plasma cell disorder? Because you're right, 10% plasma cells is not a lot, and you want to be mm-hmm. absolutely sure that that it's cause and effect that these are what's causing all these compression fractures or these fractures. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Your whole, uh, you know, description is very helpful, and so you gain more knowledge. So thank you so much for. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, and good luck my to your questions. Husband. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. So we will take another call at um, six nine zero four five nine seven. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay, caller at 690-4597. Hello? You're on the, uh-huh, you're on, you're on the line. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> oh, this is you. Oh, okay. No, that's... No, I don't know. I, I don't know. No. Uh, I guess they must have... They, they okay, we'll take another caller. Nine nine seven five one four four six. Yeah, doctor, my question is about the binding site test that you said works on IgA and IgG that, yes. uh, that quantifies the number of polyclonal versus abnormal uh, monoclonal cells. My question to you is, uh, will it give you uh, quantification if there's multiple, perhaps, subclones that have resurfaced in a uh, uh, relapse to Velcade, for example? No, okay, yeah, that uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that that's going to be a little more problematic. I was talking mostly up front. Um it's useful for that because as you probably know, m- most myeloma presents as one, sometimes two clones at presentation. The and so it's going to be dependent on if you've got multiple clones because usually even with relapse you can get po- multiple clonal heterogeneity is what we call it. If you sample like multiple, say, aggregates of plasma cells, they can often have different cytogenetic abnormalities. And there are two really interesting papers, one from um, uh, the MMRF, the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. It was a sponsored study through them. And they looked at a bunch of, uh, in a large group of investigators, looked at a bunch of uh, different sites and different, um, types of myeloma, and they found that there's a lot of heterogeneity even within the same patient. And also the um, the, the Dana-Farber group at, at about the same time in another journal published a paper also showing a tremendous amount of, of this clonal heterogeneity where even in the same patient in different lesions, you had different chromosome or different molecular abnormalities. So it's sort of, it does bring up the point that you will often have more than one thing going on. Most relapses are with, depending, we'll often have maybe a single clone, at least in the blood, but sometimes two or three. After a stem cell transplant, you can get something called oligoclonal banding. That's where you get about four, five, six, maybe three different spikes or proteins in the blood, and then they sort of go away. And then once the patient relapses, it's usually with one or two. I'm not sure um, if it were more than one or two, if it were more than two, I think it would be more of an issue. But I do know that this takes into account the different heavy chains, and it also looks at the different uh, light chains. In, so it's looking at both in the same assay. So it may be able to help quantitate perhaps a couple of clones. I think if it were three or four, it might be more problematic. But that's something that would be worth asking once the test is more readily available. At our own institution, we're hoping to have it up and running by March. But again, it was just FDA approved, I think about a month ago. I'm sorry, I couldn't be specific, but but I will go look that up now. I'm going to ask the binding site people. One follow-up question on that. Uh, For that specific binding site test is the Input uh, for testing, is it blood serum or urine? It's serum yeah, or blood. It's a blood sample, and then they run an assay. I think it's serum. It might be plasma. They're very similar but slightly different. But um, it is a blood test. 
Okay, thank you for your question. Okay, we have another caller at 992-4568. And please go ahead with your question. Hello, Dr. McCarthy. Thank you very much. You've done a wonderful job um, making a very complex disease. Um, it's, I guess it's just a little bit more than uh, you know, rest in bed, drink liquids, and take aspirin. Okay, um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, in any, any event, uh, Jenny had put on her site uh, an article with regard to uh, the use of uh, lanolidomide and secondary cancers. Yeah. And you are also listed uh, on that with Dr. Palumbo and a number of other people as co-authors. And uh, in that um, uh, short review, uh, I found that uh, a melphalan-based therapy with lanolidomide, and, and I'm not sure it, it was that way, but it has 4.8% chance of a, a hemological cancer versus uh, less than 1% without it, without uh Melphalan, is that is that how I read that? And then that, if that's so, correct. Oh, yep. And then if so, uh, does uh, the use of melphalan in a stem cell transplant uh, create the same issue? Because we we often use uh, lenalidomide in maintenance, induction, and consolidation. So you know that was you know because I've I've obviously uh, had uh, well I've not obviously but I've had stem cell transplants. Mm-hmm. And not use melf, uh, lenalidomide, but a lot of people have, and I'm sure that would be a concern. Sure. Your yeah, that. Yeah, it's complicated. So let's start with the non-transplant. Um, um, it appears that the prolonged exposure to low-dose melphalan probably is, or it appears to be bad, especially when it's combined with lenalidomide. And it's interesting when I first started out in fellowship. The fir- the original treatment for myeloma, well, the, the the first treatment that really worked fairly well was melphalan and prednisone, and we uh, the patients would take it for um, four to five days every six weeks, and along with steroids uh, with the prednisone, and then repeat. And then what would happen is you would often end up with a damaged marrow um, after say twelve months of this treatment. And it was just because the melphalan is toxic over time to the bone marrow. So it's thought that when you add lenalidomide to that, you increase that risk either sequentially or at using it at the same time. So now we're, we recommend, based on that article, we're recommending that it's probably not a good idea for prolonged melphalan exposure. Now, with regards to stem cell transplant. And then it gets really complicated. Um, The one weakness, in fact, if you read the editorial in the Lancet Oncology, one of the weaknesses of the paper was that the IFM uh, 0502 data was not included. It's not a variety of reasons why that was. So, So that's the French study. But if you compare the two studies, we both saw an increased incidence of um, second cancers. Um, there's about a 3% versus 1% in the CLGB study, and there's about a 25 7 2.7%, 3% incidence, same thing, about the same thing on the French study. The thing that was different is in the French study, they saw about the equivalent amount of myeloid malignancy, so AML, acute myeloid leukemia, or myelodysplastic syndrome. In the French study, they saw an increased incidence of Hodgkin lymphoma and acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which we were all very surprised at because that, that's not what you would have expected with alkylator uh, melphalan exposure. Usually you get these myeloid malignancies. And if you look at the treatments on the two arms, the, the induction regimens are very different. The IFM study had a lot more VAD, which, again, we don't use. Half their patients got that. The other half got bortezomib dex. And in the 100-104, about 74% of patients either got thalidomide or lenalidomide-based regimens. And then a lot of the French got a more alkylating therapy with something called Decept, and about 20% of their patients got two transplants. So just keeping all that in mind, there are enough differences. The other thing is the French patients only got two years of maintenance. Then they stopped because they, they were worried about the SPMs, uh, the second primary malignancies. We did not do that in the States. And we saw this sort of increase, and then it went away. 
So my feeling is that if you stop the if you get out to two, three years and you haven't had an SPM, you likely are not going to get one and that um and that you assume all the risk and, and potentially none of the long term benefit by stopping lenalidomide maintenance too soon. The one thing else on the Palumbo paper, um, it's sort of buried in there is that the risk of getting a second cancer is definitely higher with lenalidomide, especially with uh if with low dose melphalan. But the risk of having progressive disease and dying uh, from the myeloma was higher if you didn't get it. So it's sort of a risk-benefit thing when you look at it, um, that still the risk of the cancer coming back is much higher without some form of maintenance therapy. Now, should it be bortezomib or lenalidomide? We don't know, or should it be exazomib, this new oral proteasome inhibitor? And we're going to have to see based on just future trials. So that's why I tell patients, um, one last point. It turns out that there's, there's this entity called monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. And they those patients um, uh, will have an increased incidence of developing also acute myeloid leukemia or myeloid dysplastic syndrome, bone marrow problems. And they don't get treated. And that was based on an Ola Longren study when the, looking at a Swedish tumor registry. So we know that people who have this sort of disease, that either smoldering myeloma, MGUS, that they're not requiring therapy, they're being monitored, they still have a higher risk of developing a bone marrow disorder. So it, lenalidomide contributes to it, melphalan does, but there are other factors that we don't understand enough to be able to tell us, oh, this is a bad risk patient, so we really shouldn't expose them to this particular combination of drugs because they're going to get leukemia. We haven't been able to figure that out yet, and that's that's ongoing research. We're trying to s- sort that all out. Thank you, Doctor. I appreciate your response. I have one question that kind of goes back to what the lady had uh, asked earlier, and um, and you had uh, said about uh, this registry for um, you know allo transplants. And yeah, yeah. My question to you is, uh, how do you determine what is the most effective treatment protocol for each patient? And what I mean by that is that do you consolidate your own survival statistics at your facility so you can tell which combination is more effective, or do you use clinical trial data as a surrogate for actual you do both. clinical results? Both. Um, because you can't look at all – because you may have a biased population. You may have something different. How you do things may be a little different than somebody else. So you, you use both. We we have a large database here in our transplant center. We do about 140 to 150 transplants a year. Half are autologous and half are allogeneic. And we're always trying to figure out what can we do to make things better. Because until the day that, n- that we have to have it so that no one dies of toxicity, and nobody relapses and everybody does well. We're not there yet by a long stretch, but we're, we're better than we were, say, 10, 15, 20 years ago. So we look at our own internal data. We're always making sure we're doing things right. And, and then we also look at the published literature. We look at the that report card. When it's not, I, I'm being a little facetious by saying report card. It's an outcomes um, report. The outcomes report is got a risk stratification so that, if you do very high-risk patients, you get a higher score, and they take that into account when calculating one-year survival. Whereas if you do, your center does only low-risk patients, they get a lower-risk score, and, and the scores go from one to five. So you also have to take that into account because if, you have, if your patient population is very high-risk, destined not to do well, you're going to have a one-year survival that's going to be lower than a, patient, than a transplant center that has uh, very low-risk patients. They would, you would expect them to do better. So you have, to, you have all these other factors that come in. You know, how old are your patients? What are their comorbidities? Is the patient in a good remission or not in remission at the time of their transplant? What what other factors are involved? And it gets complicated so that you have to balance all of these out when you are trying to generate uh, reports of, of outcome. And that's why I'm, I'm they're talking about trying to do this with autos. Uh, but right now that's been very hard because um, – 
autos actually what's good it's a good problem autos do usually by and large do very well and so that for a myeloma patient the one year treatment related mortality should probably be around 5% max as an example the lenalidomide dexamethasone ecog trial that was published several years ago the the uh, overall mortality was about 2-3% i believe and so if you're in that ballpark with chemotherapy which is all outpatient as opposed to a more intensive approach with transplant, you feel good about it. So in a long-winded way, we sort of look at all factors um, because we want to make sure our results are not inferior to benchmarks uh, within the published literature because if we do have inferior results, then we're doing something wrong. Well, I think that's an excellent point on your part is that you actually are looking at those. I I you know, I personally don't quite understand why that doesn't exist, you know, because there is what the CIM BCR or whatever that thing is. Yeah. They've got all this data in there. They just don't push, publish it by site, you know, so. Um, well, they will be. <laughs> I can tell you oh, that. I'm actually on a committee um, to do that. They will and we're be. starting with, yes, it is. Wonderful. It is, it is right now it's there. If you go be, to be the match dot org, you can get it for each individual center, but you would have to spend about four hours pulling out each individual center stuff and putting it into a spreadsheet. You can figure it out. And you can figure out because the, cause they have and they they look at the results based on are your Actual results within the 95% confidence interval, in other words, there's a 5% chance it's a fluke and it's a 95% chance that it's uh, a real uh, event. So, in other words, the majority of centers are within the 95% confidence intervals for expected outcomes. So, in other words, their actual outcome is is close to what their um, expected outcome should be. There's a small number of centers about... 10 or so, or 13, whose results are above what is expected. And there's a, some centers whose results are below what's expected. You don't want to be in that latter group. And so why that is, there's a bun- bunch of reasons why that is. Um, and when I, I mean, uh, when I say you don't want to be in that group, they, they need to look at what they're doing. And then there's some centers that they go down okay. below what's expected for a year. And my then they question come back to you, up. you said the average, you know, and this is my last uh, point. I could go on and on and on, and I apologize. No, that's all that. right. <laughs> that's uh, okay, right. is that you have, um, you mentioned uh, 2% is the death uh, from a rate for people going through, like, uh, initial therapy in the first year. Unfortunately, if I look at SEER data, which represents one-third of all mm-hmm. uh, 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 all disease for multiple myeloma, and all patients, about one third in the country, they say the first year is twenty percent. And now is that, a, and last year was almost thirty percent. Right. Now it depends. It depends <laughs> if if that's overall mortality versus do you want me to stop or do you want me to keep going? Well, we have a two minute it two minute hard stop. So we uh, okay. go ahead. <laughs> Well, I'll make it real quick. There's overall mortality, there's treatment-related mortality, there's disease-related mortality. So you have to be aware of what patients are dying of. Are they dying of their disease or are they dying of toxicity of the, of the treatment? And those are all types of things. So when I say 2%, I meant 2% treatment-related mortality as opposed to disease-related mortality. That's different. Oh, okay. So, so this was actually relative. Uh, mortality that's based on yeah. Sears. So that's of all patients, all but, then, but then all patients, 20 to 25 percent die in the first year, whereas a place or like at your facility, I would imagine, I don't know because I don't have the numbers, but I know at a lot of facilities that it's only 2 to 3 percent. Yeah, but it depends because some patients are so sick they may not even be treated or they're treated with palliative treatment. So you have to look, is it, 
the average age of a myeloma patient is about 70 at presentation. But you can have people up into their late 80s, and you can have people who are in their 30s. So you really have to look at what are their comorbidities? What other things are they sick from? Are they on renal failure? Do they have bad lung disease? So you have to take all those factors into account when you're looking at overall mortality. And SEER is aggregate. This is all comers who are those who are able to be treated aggressively, those who can't be treated aggressively, et cetera. And that's why you have a higher uh, mortality because you have a much more heterogeneous population. Patients who go on clinical trials usually have to fit criteria to do that. And thus some of them, uh, patients who are bad risk may not even be on a clinical trial just because they don't fit, fit the criteria as opposed to all patients who require therapy. Okay. Well, thank you so much, doctor. I appreciate your answers. And you obviously do a remarkable job um, keeping uh, And I better say, I better say thank everything. you because we just have 10 seconds left. So thank you, Dr. McCarthy, for joining us. We are so grateful you. And that you have such deep dedication to myeloma. And keep going. <laughs> and if, there's, you know, if we can support you, we'd love to. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver. I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, void, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus.